Bullshit. It's the No Bullshit Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Our guest today is David Allen of David Allen Clothing and the Proper Knot. But first, let's hit the bullseye. Horowitz, Rudoy, and Rotman, Pittsburgh's 12th largest accounting firm, wanted to grow their business and increase brand awareness. The company decided to conduct marketing intel to learn what current clients, past clients, referral sources, employees, and others thought about their company. What did they learn? In a very brief time, they got some amazing feedback and intel. Customers and referral sources loved the company, but when they talked about it, they used a lot of different names. Horovitz, or Rudoy, or Rotman, or all three names sometimes, and sometimes just the letters H-R-R. And I guess the worst case scenario was those accounting guys from downtown, Confusion existed around the name. Clients also were more satisfied, more than satisfied, I should say, with the company. They stuck with them for decades. Like their average customer life cycle was, lifetime was 20 plus years. They would say things like, actual quotes, they're just incredible. They think about things before anyone else does. They're like family. They're knowledgeable and care about doing a good job. We trust them. They think like we do and find creative solutions. They care. But interestingly, many clients were primarily aware of only the two or three services they used the accounting firm for. An opportunity existed to explain the diverse consulting services that they offered. Employees said the company treats them like family and they stay for years, even decades, even entire careers. Horowitz, Rudoy, and Ropeman learned a lot from the marketing intel. They then took the time to focus on hit the bullseye targeting and building specific communications programs for each of their specific target audiences. Then they decided for their 60th anniversary to change the name to avoid that confusion and to increase brand awareness. They became H2R CPAs, Business Solutions Family Approach. H2R CPAs, Business Solutions Family Approach. The name has alliteration, memorable H2R like H2O, no more confusion of which name to say, no more HRR looking like a home run or looking like a human resources firm. H2R CPAs, business solutions, family approach. Talk about hitting the bullseye. The No Bullshit Marketing Show is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial. At audibletrial.com slash no BS, try a book like Real Food, Fake Food, Why You Don't Know What You're Eating and What You Can Do About It by Larry Elridge. You can download it for free today at audibletrial.com slash no BS for your free audiobook, over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. In episode one, we heard this amazing story about a young entrepreneur from Pittsburgh Grew up in Finleyville, and he has turned, uh, took his career, went to a number of different stops where he learned and grew and succeeded, but also failed and was able to bounce back from that. And that's the key thing is we all have bumps in the road, each and every person, doesn't matter who you are, and it's how you respond to that. And David Allen has responded to each one with a learning experience and moved on to the next in incredible fashion. He's the president and CEO of the David Allen Clothing Company, which produces clothing you can't find in any men's fashion store or boutique, from fully customized three-piece suits to custom-fitted dress shirts, sport coats, and pants. He's also the inventor and producer of The Proper Knot, the only necktie accessory on the market that allows you to add individuality to your existing wardrobe. And I can speak, as a customer, how easy it was to apply it while on the air While talking into the microphone, I was able to put my proper knot and make my tie today into a Valentine's Day tie. So it works, folks, because if I can do it on the air, anyone can do it, and it makes a difference. It enables one tie to become five ties. David, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. You talked a lot about the different careers that you had and how you took each one and learned from it. Along the way, did you have any mentors that you can remember and tell our audience what you learned from them? 
Yeah, I think with uh, the journey that I've been on, it's uh, very unique and different as far as finding the right mentor. Um, I didn't have anybody directly being a mentor regarding clothing, um, purely because I don't know anybody that's trying to or has uh, accomplished what I am doing right now. So a lot of the stuff that I've had was trial and error. I've relied on some successful business people to kind of pick their brains uh, throughout the last couple of years. But uh, I'll be honest, a big um, a big point to kind of give me a, a mentorship has been podcasts. Um, I have, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of windshield time with my medical sales jobs and I didn't want to sit there and listen to music for a two hour drive or a three hour drive. So I would, you know, research, find the best uh, podcast for me to listen to. And they would bring on, you know, high end successful people that told their stories. And the one thing that really stuck to me was their story wasn't different than my story. Uh, it's pretty crazy to even say that when you're talking to, you know, um, of these high end people that are billionaires that started somewhere and had that never give up attitude uh, and just did everything that they possibly could to put themselves in a position to be successful. And I don't believe in luck. I believe in creating your own opportunities. And I think that's the biggest thing with the entrepreneurial journey is that you just have to be able to work harder than anybody else and you have to be able to outwork yourself. David, what I like about your talking about podcasts is I too have found them to be so valuable. And the reason we built this podcast the way we did is because of the point you just made. There are billionaires, there are people that are celebrities, there are athletes that their stories aren't that different from ours. But I didn't want to replicate that for a number of reasons. It's really hard for me to go and get that celebrity sure. show on my show. And number two, it's being done by other people Absolutely. that are maybe celebrities themselves. So I'm not going to win. And, and my, my cumulative advantage that I talked about in episode one isn't going to happen. I'm not going to win that. But what I thought is, what if we were able to bring people like you or like Dr. Jerry Sahorchak, who was the Pennsylvania State Secretary of Education sure. under Governor Rendell and a normal guy from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. What if we were able to bring Steve Tanzilla? You mentioned Point Park yep. earlier. He's the dean of the Point Park. Greg Joseph of the Clarks. What if we're able to bring people that are more relatable sure. to our audience so they can go and get that one. There's a bunch of celebrity podcasts to hear how that they can watch Shark Tank and see Mark Cuban in sure. action. But here they're getting people like you that are hugely successful, but have done it and are much more relatable. And that's the whole model for the No Bullshit Marketing Show. Sure. And I, I think that is very powerful because oftentimes, you know, I think a big hindrance for a lot of people is they they hear that, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and they want to hear his story and they're like, well, I'll never be able to be like Mark Zuckerberg. And, and maybe that's the case, but maybe that's not the case too. But having someone that isn't as famous or isn't in the limelight like those people, to your point, really makes it relatable. And and I'm no different than anybody else. I am, uh, I'm not the smartest person. Uh, I, I didn't have anything handed to me with this. It was purely the determination that I wanted to, to, to change my career um, and figure something out. And, you know, I had a, had a great comfortable career in medical sales and I found myself always chasing the money and I would, you know, I would get goal X and then I'm like, okay, now what? And then I would get goal Y and then now what? And I just got so unhappy doing that. And it was just time to create something different. And I, I think I'm a testament to anybody out there that there's so much opportunity and it's purely who wants to go and find it and who's willing to put in the work because it is the hardest journey ever, but it's also the most rewarding journey. And I think that's the key point. Whenever you say like, I agree with you, I have so many foibles and frustrations and I drive people crazy. It comes down to who's willing to put in the work. Sure. And I think that's why it's important that I try to talk to people that are students of mine or when I'm doing mentoring through Mass Solutions or the show that I want relatable people because it really does come down to, are you willing to put the work in? And there are even times where I say, okay, I can be larger as a company. Our company can be larger, but I'd have to do this, this, and this. And I'm not ready to do that because I have balance and I have balance. That is one of my goals. Now, not a lot of people strive for that as a goal, right. but I strive for that as a goal. So my company would be double in size if I didn't get involved with coaching my sons, if I didn't go to every event. When they had their Halloween party, I was the only dad that was sure. at the Halloween thing at the elementary school every year. Not the only one. I don't want to pat myself on the back, but there were a few. Sure. But m most of all, a lot of times there weren't any parents there because they're working and there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not 
saying that we're special. I'm saying I built my company to be able to do that. Right. So you have to decide what you want to do. And then it's about the work because despite me saying I have that balance, I also last night was preparing for the show at sure. 1030 at night after coaching a basketball game. So you have to want it. Yep. And I think that if someone listens and hears that there's two normal people in their minds that aren't Mark Cuban and we're from Western PA and if someone here from Western PA is listening, they can relate to it. If they're willing to commit, they too can also achieve their definition of success because success like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Absolutely. And that's something most people don't even realize and don't even think through. If you think that through rationally, that success is in the eye of the beholder, you decide what success is. You decide. You, your success might be that your company is a multi-billion dollar company, but it could be that your success is your company is a $2 million year company, but you're living the life you want to live. It's you define success and far too many people define it as, well, Sarah is doing this and I should be trying to do that. And when you said you were chasing the goals in sales, that is one of the problems with sales. We keep a sales leader setting the goal. You win the Cancun trip. Yep. You win this. Is that really what it's about? It should be about the personal professional growth, but maybe not. There's a lot of people that that is what it's about. Sure. Yeah, and that's that's the big thing too. You know, I, I was at when I was at um, my my four year stint in medical sales at that specific company. You know, we had some guys that were pulling in some significant amount amounts of money, and um, you you know you look at the commitment that they put in there, and then you compare it to the guys that were in the middle of the road, and you know it was all about where they were in their life, um, what made them happy, where they you know, around their kids' events? Were they missing their kids' events? Were they traveling? Were they doing X, Y, Z? And I I always wanted to, you know, become a millionaire. I always wanted to make as much money as I possibly could. And I still, that is a goal that I am going to be very successful. And I hope that one day it, it does get that. But I've also realized that my happiness um, in doing something that I would, there's nothing else I'd rather do than design custom clothing, work with the people that I'm working with and um, kind of have this path that I'm on. And I'm happier now than I ever have been in my entire life, even though the struggles are massively, massively greater and the fears are massively greater. It, all that stuff is well worth it because um, I found that this is what makes me happy. But I also believe in that work-life balance as well. And, uh, you know, life is short. You know, you, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And, and that's another reason that made me kind of take this plunge Um you know, some things have happened throughout my life that have made me realize quickly that you're not guaranteed uh, the next day. And uh, it's it's very, very important for me to stress to people that you can work a nine to five and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's a lot of people that do that and are happy. And there's a lot of people that do that and make a lot of money. Um, or you can go out on a limb and try something. And, you know, maybe it is the next $10 million uh, career or maybe it's that opportunity that says, hey, I'll never miss one of my kids games ever. Um, so there's so many variations and it's all dependent on what that person wants to get out of their life. And there's a lot of people that work the nine to five that are miserable. And actually, yeah. I don't think anybody works nine to five. That's true. So too. there's a lot of people working eight to five, 15 sure. that are miserable. Sure. I, I love it because here's what I would say to anyone listening that is considering, that is maybe frustrated and considering some level of entrepreneurship. And it can be, it can be as simple as teaching a class. I have a friend who's a client who, um, wasn't, uh, was felt like she had hit a brick wall at work and she started teaching college and it just rejuvenated her. So that's her thing. That's her thing. That's her entrepreneurship. She's going beyond the regular job. Right. It's a kick ass job that she has, but she wanted to do that. And that rejuvenated her. If anyone's going to go to try something, uh, I love what you said because I, I said this on the show and where we share it is every day I have fear, more fear than I had when I was working yep, for someone else, absolutely. but I'm happier than I ever was working yeah. for someone else. And I don't know what the exact reason why, cause, because it's certainly not control because I, I give more control to my team here than I ever did working somewhere else because I had to cover my ass. Sure. I couldn't just let everybody do everything that they wanted right. to when I was a chief marketing officer because I had to cover my ass, but I have a fear every day for parts of the day, but I have an exuber exuberance for parts of every day sure. that I never had. And you just nailed that when you described it. Yeah, it's it's funny. You know, I, I right now I work multiple quote shifts throughout the day, and you know my my eight a.m. until my six p.m. is me doing the um, the daily stuff, running around working with clients or setting up meetings to further the business. Well, then I come home and I have you know dinner, uh, take a break usually from six to eight o'clock, 
And then once 8.30 rolls around, that's when my factory finally gets into the office. So then I have my 8.30 till 3 or 4 in the morning shift. And that's four or five days a week. And, you know, I'm working probably 12 to 15 hours almost every single day. And fortunately, right now, I'm not in a position where I have a, a family or kids that I have to worry about. Um, it's just me. So it's a lot more flexibility. And the, I'm hitting that point in my life at the appropriate time for me to, to really chase this dream. And uh, I know how much more difficult it would be if I did have a family or, or kids to, to provide for. Um, so the risk was just on myself. So I definitely understand and can relate to those issues. But, um, you know, it's the, the commitment is, is got to be it got to be great. The one thing I do have to say is why Darlene thinks I'm insane is uh, I made the leap when I had three kids and the third one was sure. only three months old. <laughs> and I had had my butt kissed in all those jobs when I had. I had secretaries who had secretaries who had secretaries and I had directors who had managers who had supervisors. And so I was in the position that I thought I dreamed of. Sure. And then I, and she was like, really? <laughs> really? So, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes it challenging for sure. <laughs> you mentioned about podcasts. Uh, I'd love to hear which ones people listen to. Let's talk a little bit about that. What are some specific podcasts you really like? Yeah. My, uh, the one that really got me my first, true podcast that I would listen to was a gentleman, Nathan Chan, uh, the founder podcast, mm. uh, an Australian gentleman that has uh, some really high end people on there. Um, but his podcasts are really cool because there's so many different industries that he bases it off of. Um, but he brings in all unique people that all tell the same story, even they're all they're from all over the world, all different parts of the country, and they're all in a completely different profession. Um, but the way that he kind of tees it up is just to to tell their struggles, their 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 hurdles that they've had, and um, you know, kind of like mentioned earlier, it's just it's cool to see that these people um, that are so so successful came down to the last five dollars in their account or hit rock bottom. Uh, and it seems to be the trend for those people that really, truly make it uh, financially is is you taste the bottom before you could taste the top, essentially. Um, so that's definitely one that I, I, I highly recommend. And then another one is uh, Andy Frisella. Um, he is by far probably one of my favorite um, podcasts to listen to. He releases every Tuesday, I believe. It's about an hour podcast. Um, you know, there, a lot of graphic content there, uh, some foul language and whatnot on there, but they're very blunt to the point and their basic message is just bust your ass and work and that's it. And, um, you know, there's no excuse. So mm -hmm. if you fail, don't make an excuse for it, figure out why you failed and, and, and get over that hurdle. So another one you might like is entrepreneur on fire. I, I've heard that. Yeah. I've heard that as well. That's a good one uh, that I, I was listening to that. That was probably the second one next to Nathan Chan that I listened to and I loved it. Yeah, I like that because I don't listen regularly, but uh, at any given time, he does it every single day. So at any given time, you can pop on, scan, see which entrepreneur you want sure. to hear from. And he asks them a lot of the same questions each time. So they tell sort of yeah. what we're doing here today. And it's a pretty cool one. Absolutely. I want to put you on the spot now because it is the No Bullshit Marketing <laughs> Show. Talk about a learning experience when maybe you were a BS employee, a tough boss, or your communication wasn't what it needed to be. Looking back, when do you think you might have been guilty of some BS? What would you do to fix it that might help our audience? Yeah, I think um, especially in when I was in medical sales, you don't have an office that you report to every day. Um, you, It's purely relying on trust with you and your employer that you are out there doing what you're supposed to do. And I think you know the, the hardest thing that I had was because I was chasing this dream and I had so much freedom on the side where, um, you know, my boss didn't know what I was doing every day. And, and I had to have that balance of performance, uh, so I could stay under the radar. Um, but I also had to balance me trying to pursue this career and whatnot. Um, but I, I think the one, one regret that I probably do have, um, that looking at what I'm doing now and, and I have a couple employees that I, that I work with, um, and I, I see how hard it is. Um, and I see that I could have done a little bit more. I thought that I was working hard. Um, and, and I was a hard worker for, for my employers, but I feel like I probably could have stepped it up a lot in comparison to the work that I was doing, you know, instead of cutting out at three o'clock, uh, on a Tuesday to go golfing or just to drive home. Cause I had a bad day. Um, you know, that extra two hours here or there, I think would have been, um, insurmountable as far as the longevity in my career where I would not have lost my job or whatnot. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest thing is, is 
not really taking advantage of the situation because now that I'm out here trying to do what I'm doing, um, I don't want people doing that to me at all. And, you know, it's hindsight with everything. And, um, you know, even I think the, the traveling, you know, when you, you have a budget and you go on the road and you're, you're uh, <laughs> Tuesday or Thursday and you're in Buffalo, New York, and you, you don't want to spend $50 on a meal, you should probably spend $10 on a meal and stuff like that. You sometimes, uh, you know, toe the line with a little bit. And now I'm, pinching every penny that I have and trying to really, Hey, this is a business. We have to run it like a business. So you see these massive companies and why they have their rules and regulations. Um, and now you have my small company and I'm, you know, I'm at the point where every dollar counts. So I think that's another thing too, is just be more conscious of, uh, of other people's goods, I guess you could say, and that's, resources. That's tremendous insight. And I, I can relate to that. Yesterday I had a conversation with a guy that ties to this story, a guy I really respect. He's a strategic partner. And this, this guy is really successful. Sure. He loves what he do. His passion, his company's grown exponentially. And so I say that all because, uh, budgets are important to him, but but he's pretty big time, okay? And he's telling me, he says, I had this new idea. I got the new idea in January. He said, I sat down with my team and I said, I have this new idea to expand that I think could hit big for us. And he said, here's what I would need to do. I would need to do these speak engagements. And I need to fly all over here to do these. Yeah. And I think I can land them. And he owns the company and a CEO and his CFO says, okay, now the budget for travel for the entire company is this. And he said, if you go and do what you're going to do, you're going to tap that whole budget by sure. like May. And so he tells me, he said, I'm flying on a seven hour flight in coach with two people that had to have the elongated belts or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the middle of them. Now here's this guy. It's a CEO. He's hugely successful and he's going to speak to other CEOs at a very high level. And he was telling me that making fun of himself saying that was a long ass trip. But he said, but that's what I have to do because I want to extend that budget yeah. and I have to show everybody that just because I came up with a great idea, if I prove that this starts working and we're out of budget by June, but I say, hey, it worked in March and April and May, I can justify an expenditure increase. Sure. But if I don't justify an expenditure increase, I'm done. I stop my idea and I move on. Now, that's leadership. Sure. And that's living it the way you're describing what you learned now that you're on your own. Sure. And that's no BS. Yeah. And and I think too, um, you know, I, I think a big part of that is the commitment that that gentleman has for his employees. Um, and, and that's the biggest thing that I'm trying to create is uh, an environment that people will go that extra effort um, because they respect you because they know that you're, that you're not number one to yourself. They're number one to you. And everybody that's involved in my companies um, that have helped out from the very beginning, whether it's friends that were doing free photo shoots or, um, you know, marketing or creative people that have been involved just for that sweat equity, essentially. Um, those are the people that make me want to work harder and harder every single day. Um, because I, I think that was a frustration when I was in, employed by somebody else was I didn't feel that, you know, you, you'd be 110% to plan one year and then the next year you weren't. And now all of a sudden you're a bad employee. And then that just you builds up a lot of anger and frustration towards an employer or a company. And then you start taking advantage of them. And that's something that I really want to instill as, as I move forward and continue to grow is our, our employees are not employees, they're team um, and they're family to us. And, and I'll do everything in my power to make sure they're happy first and foremost. And, and I'll take a seat on the back burner for that because they're, they're the lifeblood of an organization. And that's uh, the kind of leadership that you have and this guy has in, because I like to connect people, he wears a suit every day. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> so, so Sarah has to get us a clamor uh, audio clip of this that I can send to him. Sure. And he'll hear it. And he'll hear you say good things. Perfect. And then you connect him with the, the perfect knot and see if you can get him to go that route. Proper knot. Proper knot. It's perfect. And it's the proper knot. It's the perfect solution. The proper knot. Sorry about that. <laughs> when it comes to messaging, we have to understand both our why or reason for being and our customers why or reason for buying. And this all stems from when I read the great Simon Sinek book called Start With Why, and I thought, that's correct. David Allen and I, we have to start with why for our company. What's our reason for being? But as a marketing firm, we have to convince our customers to answer the second why, which is their reason for buying. We have to understand that. And so we tell our customers, if you can understand your why, your reason for being, and your customers why, their reason for buying, then crystallize that into one big idea, one memorable message or theme that makes an emotional impact on the target audiences. 
then you are ready to do real marketing. Then you're no longer doing no BS marketing. Whether it's for you personally or for your company, what's your big idea? I, I think the kind of what I mentioned before, our our big idea as far as the company is, is, you know, I think the, the Bay Area companies, the tech companies have really mastered that um, as far as the work environment. I, I want to create something like that where, you know, whatever environment we create for our company and our employees and our team is that uh, it's something that's conducive to their life, that family is always going to be number one to them. Um, so if something comes up and they have to go see a kid's basketball game or baseball game, go do it, you know, and as long as you get your stuff done. And I think that's where you earn the stripes of these people where they're going to want to help you get to your end goal. Um, so I, as far as an end goal, you know, I don't have any idea where this is going to go or what journey this is going to lead to. Um, I have a lot of things that we're working on right now, uh, potentially a reality TV show um, that we're in the running for right now. Um, I'm negotiating right now with uh, John Cena to be the face of my, my companies. Um, so every day we're at that stage where something new could be on the surface and uh, I don't know what to expect. My goal throughout this journey is just to take care of people, treat people with respect. And I think the the, the outcome that's meant to happen is going to happen. So I, I don't really have anything specific as far as goal wise or, or achievements, but um, I'm just trying to revolutionize and change the way people look at business in general, fashion in general, and try to put a movement behind dressing well and treating people with respect. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, the company because we spent so much time in episode one on I want to make sure if someone only catches episode two. So you're talking to John Cena. You have the WWE ties. Talk about the proper knot and also the custom suits. Yep. Yeah. So um, the proper knot, uh, we have a website, properknot.com where uh, essentially the purpose and uh, idea of why we created this is because men's fashion has not changed in years and also neckties just have not changed in forever. So the way the trend is with men's fashion is definitely on an increase. You look at all the NBA players, NFL players, every press conference you go to is, is essentially a fashion show. Um, so it's cool that that's happening because now it's more acceptable to dress a little bit different or um, stand out. And everybody's personality is so different than somebody else's. There's not too many people that are very, very similar to one another. So you're judged as a first perception without saying anything at all. So wh whatever you're wearing, however you're, you know, stand in public, how you walk down the street is purely what somebody's going to judge you on. And I think that has a lot to do with um, your personality and, and confidence as well. And I also think that it has a lot to do with the outcome on whether you're in a meeting, whether you're walking down the street, whatever it may be, people respect you a little bit differently uh, by how you present yourself. So um, that's why we created the proper knot was to add a little bit of flair, change things up a little bit. And also our custom clothing line, uh, which is davidallenclothing.com. And, um, you know, our custom clothing line is something that we just want to have fun with it. And we want people to enjoy dressing up again. And, um, you know, unfortunately in today's society, social media is, is fantastic, but it's also very detrimental, um, with different negative things that are happening all over the world, all over the country. And I think what we're trying to create is just some form of a way to just make it cool to be a good person. Um, hold the door for somebody, you know, get up and let a woman sit down, uh, you know, things that you shouldn't have to reiterate or shouldn't have to reteach or, or there that, that they need those that help. So. Now, see, that's a huge, big idea. I love it. And you will get no argument from me on the dressing. Uh, it's just awesome. I think that impression does um, make a, a positive impact. I will say there's sometimes you have to watch, like someone like me, I come across sometimes as too formal because sure. of uh, how I would dress and you have to really be quicker to connect. That's something I have to work on. But as a whole, I really like the idea of making it fun so that people realize that it can still be affordable. It is important it definitely makes a difference. And some of the people you and I have talked about off air, people that I know and you know that uh, do dress this way, it does matter. It absolutely yeah. matters. And people can say that you don't judge a book by its cover, but that's BS because we all do it even when we try not to. And that doesn't mean we won't change our opinion, but we definitely make that first impression by how the person looks, how they carry themselves, how they walk in. And it's about confidence. And if someone gets more confident because of David Allen clothing, that's going to help them to present the real them, the sure. no BS version of them. Absolutely. Pick a tool that will help our audience tell their story, craft their message, or just help them improve their productivity. It could be your favorite blog, book, productivity resource, whatever you think might help our listeners. 
I absolutely highly recommend uh, Tim Ferriss's new book, uh, Tools for Titans. It's about 600 or 700 pages, so it's a long one, but it's the way that it's presented itself. There's three different sections, and um, each section has like a three or four uh, page stint of a different CEO, different successful executive, tells their quick journey, quick tools that they've used to become successful. Uh, I recently picked that book up. And do you buy the hardcover book or do you actually use uh, the Kindle? No, I know. I do the hardcover book. I'm old school with some of that stuff. And um, I don't have a lot of downtime. Uh, so now when I do, that's kind of my go-to is I put that you know on my recliner and, and read for a couple, you know, 30, 40 minutes, an hour here and there. And I think that's been the most beneficial thing. Um, but I also, as far as like tools for uh, administrative purposes, things like that, uh, I would say Google Drive is probably my savior with, uh, with all that because you can have quick access to everything, save everything on there, and uh, it's easy presentable on the phone. So I like both. Uh, Tim Ferriss is has always been an interesting, um, interesting person for me because I I move I vacillate on Tim Ferriss, sure. and here's why: overall, fantastic, talented, successful. But there's some BS. Like you listen to his podcast, and you kind of go, "Come on!" Right. But then you do get a nugget. So then you say, "Okay, I spent an hour. I listened to some bullshit, but I did get that one nugget." Yep. And four hour work week uh, overall as a concept kind of BS title, but there's a bunch of concepts in that book that kind of work. And so you go, okay, I took six concepts out of this, even though the book title is kind of a scam. Right. So I, I, I bounce around on Ferris. Overall, I give a positive to yeah. him and I still catch his podcast. And I, I'm now going to buy his book because I didn't realize it was out. And I do buy pretty much all of his yeah. books. So I, I like him. But I don't know if you see what I see, that there's some of the stuff yeah. you kind of shake your head. I, I And that's the problem I have with like the Grant Cardones, people like that. You know, their their first priority is to sell X, Y, Z. And I understand that um, at this stage in my game as an entrepreneur, and, and I'm assuming even if we're a $50 million company, that one nugget that you can get out of, out of a book, whether it's 600 pages and you pull one pearl, I think it's well worth it. And um, that's the cool thing about it. There's so many different perspectives of people in there that you typically do get a couple of things, but I'm, I'm definitely on board with your, uh, your viewpoint on that. I take the approach with my blog called light reading. It's 350 words or less because I feel I give nuggets in one or two or, or three in every one. It's only 350 words. Right. So that's where I just have a different opinion. I'm kind of like, just do it quicker. Like this podcast is 30 minutes here that we've talked in episode two. And I'm hoping that some of the stuff you said becomes a nugget for right. some of the listeners. Right. And so that's kind of the thing. So, so we're in complete agreement there. Uh, anything you thought I'd ask you that I didn't or anything you want to add about any of your products that I didn't say or how to get them or what, what the process is? Yeah, like, like I said, our, our website is propernot.com. Um, so we're still really growing that company. And then uh, davidallenclothing.com. And that's just A-L-A-N. Uh, so davidallenclothing.com. But um, no, I think we definitely addressed everything. I, I just The biggest thing that I want to reiterate to everybody out there is... Uh, the opportunity is truly there. You know, I went from humbly went from uh, starting with one WWE superstar to styling over 40 WWE wrestlers um, to now having a regular text message, phone call conversation with John Cena uh, who reached out to me to be the face of our company. And um, I say that because I didn't have a background in anything that I'm doing. I didn't have a mentor in anything that I'm doing with uh, regards to the clothing and everything has pretty much been trial and error. And I fortunately put myself in a position financially uh, through medical sales where I did invest and save money um, that I was able to patchwork my life together until our company became profitable. And um, so my biggest thing is there there is opportunity for everybody out there. You you have to be willing to do whatever you have to do to survive and to make it. And uh, obviously ethical, uh, number one, but um, it, it, I'm living a dream right now. And I'm 31 years old and, and uh, um, 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 the opportunities are endless. And, uh, you know, it was a it was a tough, tough road. I wanted to quit almost every single day. Um, but then you get a little bit of a, Hey, this is cool. Well, let's keep going. And then the next day you get, well, that's cool. And little things like that are what pushes you through the, the tough times. And, um, you do have to, to go through the, the dirt before you, you spin that around and, and become successful. But once you become and, and overcome that, it's, it's, there's not a better feeling in the entire world. That's David Allen, an inspiration to anyone that is an entrepreneur or considering entrepreneurship. David, thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me. 
And to our listeners, thanks for joining us for the No Bullshit Marketing Show. Visit MassSolutions.biz for show notes plus additional marketing and messaging resources and sign up for light reading to receive valuable ideas to improve your marketing and transform your message. It really is light, intended to be read in two minutes or less, and it just might trigger bright ideas for you to sign up again, MassSolutions.biz. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions.